Josh. Oh, hamstring up. <laughs> Sniper, take the other picture. Yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how you can formulate opinions without having true facts. I'm telling you, think about it logically for just a second. Dear Reds fans, Welcome back to the Zebra Zillionaires. It was a tough one yesterday. Live from Chatterbox Sports Studios, it's Off the Bench with Tom Brenneman. Well, good morning, good morning, and a pleasant good Thursday morning to each and every one of you. We welcome you to Off the Bench, presented by our good friends at United Dairy Farmers. I'm Tom Brenneman. We come your way Monday through Friday, 10 A to 12 P. P. That's Eastern time. Are we all good over there, Casey? Everything okay? Yeah, we're good. Casey McAllister, good morning. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Reed Mouse, Elliot Rearing, good morning, men. Good morning, good morning Tom. Tom. Everybody all right today? Oh, yeah. We're great. Okay. A lot of you guys are already getting beat up on the chat here a little bit, so I'm wondering where Reed's Mostly just me. Kenny Pickett jersey is today. More on that later. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. Chatterbox Sports page. We're also live on Twitter, or it's called X now. Please forgive me. And many of you like to join us in podcast form, and we say thank you for that. Just search off the bench with Tom Brenneman, and you're dialed in. You need to fix something over here. Well, come on, come on, come on over. Before we get into anything <laughs> serious sure here, everything's time now. there we go. You <laughs> we just fixed it, Casey. Now I, I could hear. You can hear. Are we there? No, I, I just lost it. You plugged it in, uh, and uh, it started uh, to work. Uh, what? And then I, I'm not sure what happened. Now we're All right, let's back. try to, I mean, let me hear you guys. Testing, one, All two, right, three. You would think we would do this before the show started, <laughs> but uh, no, no, no. I'm not <laughs> going to beat down. That's why you come off the bench. I'm not going to beat down, Casey. He's my buddy. I got his back. <laughs> I, mean, I got his back. I got his back. That's all I'm saying. You've got, got his back. back. He's got you. Got, he's uh, got I got your back. back. I don't know about I these other back, two Tom. in the peanut gallery, but I got yeah. your back, Casey. Tom has your back. I always have a soft spot in my heart. And for years and years when I was doing all the big network stuff and flying around, and I always used to get tight with the guys who were punching up all the stuff to make it happen. Well, it's the Tom, most important job in the whole room. Tom, I've got your back. I know you do. And I appreciate it. I appreciate it. When the season began, the Texas Rangers were one of six franchises to have never won a World Series. Their journey began in Washington. They were the Senators then before moving to the Lone Star State. They had some good teams, a couple of really good teams, teams that made it to the World Series, some great players, right? <clears throat> they get to the Fall Classic a couple of times but never close the deal. Last night, as you know, all of that changed after a huge spending spree over the last two winters and major acquisitions at this year's trade deadline. The Rangers, for the first time, are champions of baseball. They beat Arizona four games to one after last night's win. Corey Seager, one of those huge free agent signings, becomes the second player ever to win the MVP award in World Series, two of them, Reggie Jackson, the other. Free agent Nathan Avaldi has etched himself without question as one of the greatest postseason pitchers of all time. He was extraordinary last night. It's hard to believe this is a team that lost 16 out of 20 games during a stretch through August and September. In this year's postseason, the Rangers did not lose a single game on the road. Congratulations to Bruce Bochy, their manager. He came out of retirement to win his fourth World Series crown. Now the offseason begins, and that includes the Cincinnati Reds offseason. What will they do with this windfall of unexpected cash due to this year's success and expiring contracts? What's the future hold for Joey Votto? We'll talk to the Hall of Famer Marty Brenneman about that in a couple of minutes. Bengals continuing their preparations for Sunday night's clash with the Buffalo Bills. One question that was asked to Bills head coach Sean McDermott yesterday is will DeMar Hamlin play in the game? He said it's strictly a football decision and not an emotional decision. He will make that decision by game time. Of course, all remember Hamlin suffered that cardiac arrest in January last season here in Cincinnati. He has only been active for one game so far this year, kickoff 820p on Sunday night. 
Bengals will be di dialed in tonight, no doubt. The Steelers take on the Titans in the Steel City. Injured quarterback, Reed Mouse's guy, Kenny Pickett, says right. he will play despite being knocked out of Sunday's loss to Jacksonville. College football, this Michigan thing, a vast majority of Big Ten coaches express their frustrations over this sign-stealing investigation in a 90-minute video call yesterday with Commissioner Tony Petiti. ESPN reported that the 60 minutes of the 90 on the call was described as emotional, intense, and even anger. Collectively, the coaches in the conference want the conference to act right now. Right now. Don't wait for the NCAA. And I'm going to have a lot of comments later because, sadly, a man I knew, I'm not going to claim to be great friends with him, but I do have a couple of great stories as one of the giants in all of sports history, quite honestly, in American history, passed away yesterday. Robert Montgomery Knight, a Buckeye born and bred from Orville, Ohio, died yesterday at his home in Bloomington, Indiana at 83. Knight won a national title as a player at Ohio State. He won three national titles as head coach at Indiana, including college basketball's last undefeated season in 1976. He won an Olympic gold medal as head coach of America's last amateur team in 1984. After 30 years at IU, he was fired for his behavior off the court and on the court and even in practice. After seven years at Texas Tech, he would become college basketball's all-time winningest coach. He retired in 2008. I have a lot of stories to tell about Bob Knight later. Uh, I was going back and forth with one of his sons last night, Tim Knight. Um, and we'll get into all that a little bit later on. My dad knew Bobby Knight. In fact, that's how I got to meet Bobby Knight uh, for the first time. When Bobby came down to spring training in Tampa, Florida. And uh, dad, I'm sorry for your loss. I, I know you knew him and thought the world of him. And um, I'll tell you, uh, I know you have the athletic, and I talk about the athletic every day, and people think I'm on the payroll. I'm not. I don't know if you've had a chance yet uh, to read the story written by Seth Davis today about Bobby Knight. For anybody yes, who's did. young or old, and especially for the young people, because when I used to announce with Harry Carey, he had reached a point in his career where the only thing people knew about Harry Carey or thought about Harry Carey is that he was this guy that drank a lot of beer and slurred his words, and that's the only thing they remember in singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. They did skits on it on Saturday Night Live. For a lot of young people, that's the only thing they know about Bobby Knight, throwing chairs, grabbing a player at practice, grabbing him by the jersey, grabbing him by the throat, a bully, all these things. He was so much more than that to the young people who played for him. Yeah, and I think uh... – I think when you read about the very emotional, for want of a better term, homecoming a couple of years ago when he came back, he finally relented and, and agreed to come back uh, at the request of a number of his players. And it, it was a very emotional evening. And the number of former IU players that turned out, all of whom played under Coach Knight, uh, was overwhelming. Uh, I read some comments about uh, from Isaiah Thomas, and, and about the relationship that he had uh, with Coach Knight. Uh, he, he, was, he was a guy who was a lightning bug because it was only one way as far as he was concerned, and that was his way. Uh, whether you like it or not, uh, that's, that was the makeup of the man and the things that he did on the court uh, when his temper got the best of him in many respects, overshadowed a lot of the great things that he did. I think the greatest single thing he ever did was the commitment that he made to Landon Turner and his family when he was in, involved in an auto accident that paralyzed him, I think, from the neck down. Yep, yep. And Bobby made it his life's work from that point on to make sure that this former player of his was taken care of uh, not only physically, but, but uh, financially. Uh, there wasn't anything that uh, Bob Knight would not do to enable this young man to live the life that had been dealt him because of the auto accident. And a lot of coaches, uh, for my money, the majority of coaches would never have gone to that extent um, to take care of a kid that 
was uh, in his program, and, uh, and, and uh, it's irrelevant whether he was a good player or not. He was. And the other part of it is that he was tough. I know I read the piece that said he never practiced longer than two hours because he didn't feel like kids could commit themselves mentally to any longer than two hours of practice. And they were arduous. Uh, they were hard. They were everything difficult and unlike any other practice session on any college campus in the country. And, and it was like that the whole time you were there. But once you finished at IU, um, he was available to you for anything. He then became a friend. He became a friend and a confidant. And, and you could never uh, get a call him when you were in need of something and not get a hold of him. He was a totally different person with those guys once they took off that uniform for the last time. Um, I understand how people feel about him uh, in a negative sense. But, you know, I got to know him pretty well back in the 70s because he was a huge Reds fan. Uh, he'd come to spring training. He and Sparky were very close. He and Bench were very close. Um, and noted Johnny made comment about that on Instagram this morning. Yep. Uh, he, he, was, he was really an unusual guy. And without any question, they can say yes or no as far as what they feel about him. But nobody can ever deny the fact that he was truly one of the great coaches in the history of basketball, and that transcends high school, college, and professional ball. You know, there were a couple other pieces in there in The Athletic today. There were four or five lengthy stories. So if you're going to sit down and read these, including the one by Seth Davis, if you're able to get The Athletic, it's going to take you a little while to get through them. Um, yes, and, it is. You know, you talk about, and you had a chance to actually be a small part of it, um, they got into the whole thing about the 1984 Olympic team uh, and how yes. uh, most teams in the past would do their practices and their tryouts in Colorado Springs. Knight said no chance. And he said, I'm bringing everybody to Bloomington, Indiana. And he brought in 75 players. This is a big story about how he cut guys like Charles Barkley and John Stockton and kept some other guys that people thought, what's this guy doing? Uh, and then they steamrolled everybody. They won every game by more than 32 points in the Olympic Games uh, to win the gold medal. But, but once they got to Los Angeles uh, to get ready for those Olympic Games, it, 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 it was just incredible, the talent on that team. Well, the funny thing about that, Tom, is before they went to L.A., after they left Bloomington, and it was a week away from the beginning of the Olympic Games, and he and his team – were based for two or three nights in San Diego. And the Reds happened to go, be going into San Diego to play the Padres. Uh, Jim Ferguson, who was the Reds media relations director, uh, he and Bobby Knight were very, very close. And, and I get a call the first day in to San Diego from Ferguson at the hotel, and he said, uh, uh, he said, Bob asked me to get in touch with you and see if you'd like to come over to the San Diego Sports Arena tomorrow morning to watch um, the Olympic team scrimmage the Portland Trailblazer rookies. And this was when Jack Ramsey was coaching uh, a, a, in Portland. And it was a closed, everything was closed. And no, no media ever got in to watch this team practice. And I'm sure uh, to some extent that was uh, not, not as true, but certainly at times it was like that in Bloomington. Um, and he said, nobody's going to be in there but the two teams and um, – any NBA scouts that wanted to come in and watch, they were welcome. And he said, we're supposed to meet uh, uh, Bobby. Uh, he gave us the door. To just, it was just Jim Ferguson and me. And uh, so we, we go to the sports arena, I think like at 930 in the morning, and, and Bobby Knight was there to meet us and walked us through uh, the hallways into the arena and got in there. And I think every NBA team was represented and watch him practice. And it was one of those scrimmages where either coach could stop play at any time if there was something he saw that he did not like and go out and, and talk to the player involved and try to make sure that whatever infraction he committed uh, would not happen again. And uh, it, it, <laughs> it was very interesting. Uh, he, he said things that day. He kicked the ball halfway up the lower deck of the of the facility because he got mad at, at Wayman Tisdale, who uh, allowed a, uh, a pick and roll to beat him twice 
down the floor. And can Bob Knight call time out and went out there and uh, he, he told him he's I well, he said some bad things to him. And then that night we had him on the radio and, and he, he made the comment that Wayman Tisdale was the finest young man he had ever had the privilege of coaching. That he was the son of a Baptist minister. He said Michael Jordan was the greatest athlete that he'd ever been associated with. Uh, but it was an experience I'll never forget. And I felt I felt kind of honored that he would ask me to be one of two people that he would allow to come in and 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 watch the scrimmage. But he, uh, I, I felt privileged to have known him pretty well in the decade of the 70s. Once uh, I think he hooked up with Tony Larusa and the Cardinals got to be a good ball club. He he walked away from us and and opened the door <laughs> to St. Louis and and that was the end of that. But uh, I, he he was something, boy. He really was. Yeah, it's just uh, it's a part of of American sports history that that I think pretty much now is is close to being gone with a guy like him being yeah. uh, being able to coach the way he coached the style, uh, whether you liked it or didn't like it. Uh, his last game, he played the song down at Texas Tech, uh, "My Way" by Frank Sinatra, uh, and, right. and he pointed out that in that song. You know, the, the, the words, something to the extent, uh, are there regrets? Of course there are regrets. He said, I wish there were things I did different and handled differently and all those kinds of things. But he still thought to the very end that his way was the right way. And, I mean, when, when you stop and look at what the word discipline means, and that was his word. I mean, that was his right. word, was discipline. That meant on the court. That meant off the court. That meant as a program. Not one time in his 40-something years of coaching – was there ever NCAA rules ever broken? He would not take the shortcut nope. to win a game. Um, and, and there is so much to be said for that. Uh, and and I, I just really hope that young people especially, uh, even his worst critics, and there are a lot of them out there and justifiably so, I hope that right. they can look at the end of the day the story of a man who was so much more good than the not good. And I think that's a lesson yep. really for everybody. No, I agree with you, hundred um, percent. All right, I want to get into baseball a little bit now. The Rangers, I, you know, look, it's it's an unbelievable story. You and I have both known Bruce Bochy for a long, long, long time. Couldn't be happier for anybody on the planet. Him coming in there and coming out of retirement and getting the victory, um, you know, it, they, they were an amazing story. The, the 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 ups and downs that team went through this year of playing well, not playing well, injuries, guys coming back, guys you paid money that never played at all. In Jacob Degrom's case, it was an amazing journey for that team. Well, I mean, you know, I think we all knew me even before that series started. Uh, if if uh, Bruce Bochy never had won another uh, World Championship, he was going to be a Hall of Famer. It's almost incomprehensible for me to imagine in this day and time. And I, when I say that, I cover the last 25 years or so, that one man can manage four world championship teams. And it's just incredible what he's done as a manager. He came out of retirement to take on the Texas job. He obviously knew something that none of us did. And 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 now they celebrate uh, the first world championship ever uh, as far as that franchise is concerned. Um, I, you know, I, I was pulling for Arizona. I thought Arizona could win that that World Series uh, because of the momentum that they built up. Uh, and I think the first game was the most telling game of all yeah. because they were one out away from winning it when uh, the man who became the World Series MVP, Corey Seager, hit the two-run home run of the ninth inning to tie it. And then they win it in extra innings because then, uh, you know, Arizona came back and won the second game 9-1. to one, and Now they go to – uh, they go to Phoenix, and they're all even at 1-1. So the Diamondbacks were where they wanted to be. But Texas just overwhelmed them. Uh, Ivaldi, as you mentioned, one of the all-time great postseason pictures uh, in the history of the game. He goes 5-0 and in the postseason. He was brilliant last night. Uh, it, it's just a great story for Texas. And even though they were beaten rather soundly in the World Series, it was still an unforgettable year. For Tori Lovello and, and, and the Arizona Diamondbacks, they had the season that nobody anticipated them being able to, to enjoy. Uh, they did. They just uh, they just picked the wrong time to stop hitting, and then they just fell apart last night. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned some individual accomplishments. One 
that I think should be recognized and is getting some play, and it should be, is the story about reliever Will Smith, 34 years old, a part of the Texas Rangers. He did something, or it was a part of something that has never, ever been done in the history of the game, and it may be a long time before it's ever happened again. And that's the last three years, played for three world championship teams, mm-hmm. and all three are different ball clubs. The Los Angeles Dodgers, the Atlanta Braves, and and now the Texas Rangers. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's an incredible. Or Houston, I should throw in there. Uh, it's a, it, yeah, it's Atlanta, it's yeah. Houston, and it's Texas. Yeah. Three straight world champion. That's unbelievable. I mean, you talk about uh, an incredible good luck charm. Good golly, I couldn't believe it when they when they made mention of it last night and read it again today, just to be sure I got the story right. But it, you know, there were some exciting moments in that World Series, and now, as you mentioned, the series is over, and now the real business gets down to brass tacks. You know, it also reinforces something that, uh, you know, you'll have the you'll you'll have the people that will scream and yell about, you know, the small market team, the mid market team and oh they can compete with the big boys. And look at the fact that the Yankees and the Mets um, and the Dodgers were not in the World Series uh, and the Padres didn't make the playoffs. Neither did the Mets or the Yankees, big spenders. Um, But again, this reinforces, I think. Baseball's problem when it comes to the to the big market teams. I mean, the Texas Rangers spent money like drunken sailors, and God bless them to go out there and do it. When you look at the guys they signed and the contracts they gave, they gave a gazillion dollars to a guy who pitched a month in Jacob DeGrom yeah. and, and didn't skip a beat. They get to the trade deadline, and they're like, all right, we're getting a role as Chapman before the deadline. We're getting Jordan Montgomery. You know, they, they, we're getting Max Scherzer and taking on those contracts and knowing what's coming. The big market team still owns baseball. Oh, I, I don't think there's any question about that. They, you can have an isolated situation. Um, and, and let's face it, Arizona is an isolated situation yep. in terms of, 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 of team salary. Uh, but they didn't win it. They got there, but they did not win it. Um I, I I don't know that there's an answer. There probably isn't an answer to the haves and the have-nots. Although, you know, uh, those who would argue what you just said, well, okay, well, how do you account for San Diego then? Hey, they had the biggest payroll of anybody. And they didn't even make the postseason. Well, and the story so, came out today, Dad, that you probably saw it. The story came out today. They had to take an $80 million loan to make payroll. Yes, yes. Yeah, I read that story, but it also pointed out that it's not unusual for teams to do right, that. Right. Um, but it, but it certainly underscores. It becomes a bigger story because it was the San Diego Padres, and so much was made all season long about how much money they'd spent, and now they may well be forced to trade one of their outstanding players, uh, the Soto kid, uh, to try and, and help to get things back in order financially. Uh, but it, as far as the big picture is concerned, I, I don't know what you do about that because it's been a battle that uh, the, the small market teams have been battling with the major market teams. Uh, it's often like uh, I've often said that when they talk about well-run uh, organizations and, and the greatest commissioner of any professional sport, in my mind, in the history of professional sports was Pete Rozell back in the 60s when he had the wisdom and foresight to realize that down the road, it, it might be, uh, it might be beneficial to his sport to set up a structure of rules that enable everybody to share equally in the money. And, and I think if there's, and, and, and they, they did that, that could never happen again. That could never happen in baseball because too many precedents have already been set. Um, but in the NFL, it's not about who has the most money. It's who has the best front office, the most astute football people, both in coaching and in scouting. Uh, so I, and it, may take, it might mean money later on when you have to you know, give a pitcher, a, a player, uh, for instance, Joe Burrow and people like that, uh, untold millions of dollars to stick around. 
but at least uh, they're set up a little bit differently than Major League Baseball is concerned. And I think baseball would love to have some of the rules to operate under that football has, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. Yep, yep. Too much power in that union. There's no doubt about that. That's right. right. Now now we shift gears to the Reds. Somebody in the chat suggested the Reds ought to trade Ellie De La Cruz for Will Smith. Pretty good line. Um, (laughs) Not a bad line. Come on. Um, So we have talked with you on this show about the things that you think the Reds ought to do and ought to pursue. Veteran pitcher, address the bullpen, they got to have a little more thunder from, uh, from the left side of the plate in the lineup. All, all of those things we've talked about. But the question right. I have for you is, the Reds don't open the books. No baseball team opens the books. When the season started, they had crowds of 6,000 and 7,000. They start playing great. All of a sudden, they're selling out virtually every other game uh, once a team got to June. Um, and, and so they had a windfall of cash that starts coming in that they never thought that they would have. There's no debate about that. Mike Moustakis is off the books. I think Bronson Arroyo is finally off the books. Junior, I think, has one more year. But those two guys are off the books, and $25 million for Votto off the books. Do you, if you're a Reds fan, should you expect them to go out and start spending some cash on this team? Uh, Yeah. I, I, now, you know, when you're talking about spending cash, you're, you're, anybody who thinks they're going to go out and do what uh, San Diego did, what Texas did, uh, that's that's uh, that's delusional. Uh, but I think that the one area that I think they need to uh, – well, two, really. You mentioned you mentioned a big three as far as I'm concerned, and that is a veteran starting pitcher with a great track record who also has great influence on younger pitchers, a.k.a. Tom Seaver in the 70s, Bronson Arroyo in this in this century. Um, uh, uh, another, a left-handed bat uh, to, to with some thunder. They have may be the two areas in which they might have to extend themselves a little bit in terms of how much they would be willing to pay. But I don't, uh, I think they are smart enough to know that they made more money than they ever dreamed they were going to make based on the way this talented bunch of young people played and so i would say yeah i I would think there is an expectation on the part of the fan that this club go out and spend some money to try and best they can to improve themselves to put themselves in a position of of being a major player in the national league central next year i think they're have a tremendous advantage right now as we talk and this can change uh they're in a division that's very winnable uh, if they do their due diligence and do the things they need to do to improve upon a team that was a winning team in 2023. And I don't, I don't think it's unreasonable for fans to think that um, in light of what happened this past season, in light of money coming off the books, uh, to go out and spend some money to, to really improve this club and put them in a position that when people start talking and prognosticating about 2024, their names will be mentioned prominently along with the other people that they feel like could be contending teams uh, in the next baseball season. Uh, we've talked about the Votto situation uh, ad nauseum, but I, I, a different twist on this. I'm just curious your opinion. Don't the Reds really need to, to, to decide this ASAP about what they're going to do with him? And, and Votto well, has got decisions five. to make, too. I know they have a number of days before you have to go through all that now at the conclusion of the World Series. But wouldn't you say that that is something that they need to just get done one way or the other so they can move on with whatever it is else they want to do this offseason? Well, I'm not so sure they haven't already done that, Tom. Uh, okay. I mean, whatever major announcement could be made, uh, as you and you well know the rules in Major League Baseball, you can't make a major announcement while the World Series is going on. You can make piddly announcements that don't amount to anything, uh, but you can't make a major announcement until the World Series has been concluded. Um, so I'm not so sure that uh, that decision has not already been reached. And if it hasn't, again, they've got five days from the time the World Series ends to make a determination on Joey Votto. Uh, now, I don't know that uh, that, that five days would include, uh, you know, if, if they were to have met 
uh, and, and he, I'm just hypothetically saying now that he walks in and says, uh, you know, to Nick Crawl, tear that uh, contract that stipulates I get $20 million next year if you bring me back. Tear that up. We'll negotiate a new deal. Um, that could that could happen. And even if at the end of five days he, you know, he becomes a free agent, that doesn't mean that he can't still negotiate with a club that uh, whose contract has run out and he can come back to that team. But I, I uh, yes, I think that they, uh, I think the fans are waiting with bated breath right now to find out uh, what the direction they're going to go in relative to Joey Votto. And and uh, from a from a fiscal uh, standpoint, I think they need to make a decision on that. Obviously, that could dictate to some extent where else are they going and how much are they willing to spend uh, with uh, with a, a, an eye toward improving the club by bringing in new people. I just don't see where there's any wisdom at all in paying him twenty million dollars in 2024 uh, at his age, uh, at, 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 with the kind of numbers he's posted the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I, he's had injuries. Uh, he, he's had a multitude of things that have dictated that this is not the same Joey Votto that we saw for so many years as one of the great players in the game. And so uh, they've got to make a decision, and, and it's going to be interesting to see which direction they go in. Um, but I don't think it would be good business to bring him back with a, a $20 million price tag as per the current contract. Um, and the other part of that is, and I read a piece the other day that uh, some writer wrote that as far as he was concerned, it was a done deal because Joey Votto wants to play a lot. Uh, the club is not in a position where they are going to allow him to play a lot and take playing time away from the uh, Christian and Carnacion strands of the world. Um, and, and I think that's a factor that also could enter into a final decision about Joey. Uh, even if they bring him back, uh, if you commit yourself to Encarnacion strand, and why would you not? Because I think this kid will hit 30 to 40 home runs if he plays uh, 140 games or more. Um the only way I could see Votto playing would be periodically to spell Encarnacion Strand and play uh, be a DH, but only against right-handed pitching. Mm -hmm. So I think his playing time could well be limited so as these kids can continue to improve. It's, it's a convoluted situation that I think will be all sorted out uh, by uh, sometime early next week. Okay. Okay. Uh we open it up to the floor. Fellas, let me just tell you ahead of time. Elliot, Reed, yeah. okay? Yeah. Casey, I asked my dad Hi, about guys. Votto. I asked him about Votto, and I asked him about the Reds spending money. We yeah. talked about the World Series a little bit. So just in case you were so busy doing something else, yeah. Elliot, is there anything you would like to ask the Hall of Famer? Yeah, I have. Uh, that I haven't asked. Yeah, well, let me let me try my best. Hi, hi Marty. This is Elliot here. Uh, I, I just hi, want, Elliot. I just wanted to ask you, one of the one of the best parts of last season, I'd argue, is the fact that, and I'm going to say this as respectfully as I can, Marty, the team was supposed to be trash. It was supposed to be a 60-win team, not a lot of hope. They exceeded those expectations, got our hopes up. This season, the expectations are now significantly higher. When was the last time expectations were this high in this city for the Reds? Oh, I, I, that's a good question. I would say sometime early in this century. Uh, maybe 2010, whatever the year was, they played the Giants and won the first two and then lost three in a row. But that was still a good ball club. Um, that 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 would probably be it. Um, I agree. I, I mean, somebody could come up with another time that I can't remember, but I don't remember a lot of stuff at 81 years old. So, um, I, But I would say it was a long time ago. I really would. All right. Well done, Elliot. Thank well you. Well done, Thank you, Zebra. guys. Reed Thank Mouse. you. Uh, the floor yeah. is yours. Hi, Marty. Uh, we were having a discussion in the in the office yesterday about yes. which sport is it harder to win a championship in, football or baseball. I have the opinion that it's harder to win a championship in baseball. For that reason, there hasn't been a repeat champion since the 2000-1999 Yankees. There's been 16 different teams that have won this century. Um do you think it's harder to win a championship in baseball or football? Now, the football obviously has salary cap and all those things installed. Which do you think it's harder to win? I think baseball is harder to win. 
I truly do. I think because you have to address so many different areas. Um, uh, you play 162 games. I, I would say baseball would be the hardest to win a world championship in. You go back to the, you know, when I first got interested in the game was way back in the 50s when the Yankees seemingly won every year. Uh, but the Yankees won seemingly every year when they clearly had the best team in all the Major League Baseball. And to their credit, they went out and proved it. Um, I, 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 I can't imagine an argument strong enough to make me think that either football or basketball, I don't know a whole lot about hockey, uh, would be more difficult to win. But I would say baseball would be the sport. All right. Uh, Casey McAllister, please, please continue to deliver the goods as your predecessors have for a change. Well, listen, I was going to ask the exact same question. Oh, oh here we go. So, here we so, go. <laughs> so I am actually going to ask just a very simple question. Marty, are you going to be watching Thursday Night Football tonight? Are you going to be watching any sports tonight? Do you have any winners for, for Elliot over here? Because he needs some. Who's playing on TV tonight? We got the Steelers versus the Titans. Well, I, I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> uh, yeah, in this household, because um, Amanda is a died in the wool Pittsburgh Steelers fan, um, oh, no. and and I'm a big fan of the coach. Um, I, I would probably lean toward pulling for Pittsburgh, but at times they are so bad. I mean, their defense is wonderful, their offense is almost non-existent. Um, but I I might watch a little bit of that game tonight, but I'm not really certain. There you go, Casey. There you I'm go. waiting for college basketball now. Yeah, baby. It's coming yeah. up. I still there think is. the biggest story there is on the planet, Dad, outside of what's going on in the Middle East, is this Michigan football thing. People on the show are t- getting tired of hearing it. But, man, uh, if you read the story today about that conference call with Tony. Can you imagine being in Tony Petiti's shoes? Tony Petiti no. used to run CBS Sports, okay, for decades, Right. He decided the Jim Nances of the world and the Tony Romos of the world and all this sort of stuff. And now all of a sudden, he goes to become commissioner of the Big Ten. And in his first football season, he's got this to deal with. No, I, but, you know, I, whatever he's making, I don't feel sorry for him yeah, because yeah. the old adage is that's why you make the big bucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you talk about articles. I found the one where they anonymously interviewed 50 coaches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Division one coaches. Uh, the, the Athletic is a wonderful publication, but you've talked about it before, and I concur 100%. Uh, they write great pieces, and this one dealt with should they be penalized, shouldn't they be penalized, all ranges of different topics off of that. Um and, and I would have loved to have been eavesdropping on that conference call yesterday because – I think, and I agree 100%, if you wait until the NCAA makes a a determination, most of those guys who are playing today for Michigan will be on Medicare. It won't make any difference. Um, But the elephants in the room are, the one, the university itself, and also in a bigger picture is a Big Ten. And I think they will make a determination, and I I think out of that piece that dealt with the 50 coaches – Um, One of the things that you can nail them with right now is to ban them from playing for the national championship this season. Now you have imposed a penalty that is egregious and and, and hits home. Uh, I don't know that because the almighty dollar is first and foremost that anybody would have the guts to make a decision like that. But I think that if you're waiting around for the NCAA, who is the worst organization on the face of the earth from a sports perspective, uh, they don't do a damn thing for my money. You know, this is the type of thing that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed right now. And I think somebody, I think a lot of people have clear evidence that this occurred and, and maybe they even know the people involved in the university uh, who uh, who funded uh, Cotter Stallions to travel all over the country and watch college football games. Uh, I, I just get upset because the NCAA takes such a long time, and I don't want to hear that crap about. Well, we have to we have to do our due diligence and make sure that we don't don't leave any stone unturned. That's a bunch of crap. It's all about money. It's all about making the right decision. 
that will benefit them uh, and benefit the TV networks. Uh, so I, I'm going to see what the Big Ten does because I think they right now are in the driver's seat toward making a decision that will get the attention of everybody on the college in the college landscape. Yep, I'm with you all the way. Um, it's going to be in the Big Ten lap. There's no doubt. I mean, there's no doubt about this because Michigan's yep. certainly not going to come out. Uh, they they gave Harbaugh that three game I mean, total joke suspension before the year uh, that had to deal with recruiting during COVID. They've got this other thing going on that nobody talks about. That now all of a sudden the FBI is involved in about yeah, this computer right. usage that went on from their former offensive coordinator and Matt Weiss. So that this whole thing reeks so bad, it's insane. Um, and I don't say it, I said it yesterday, I don't say it as an Ohio State fan. If this was going on at Ohio State, if it was going on at Ohio University, I'd say throw the book at him. And that's what Tony Petiti yeah. ultimately is going to have to do. All right. Um, right. All right, anything else big that you'd like to get off your chest, or, or should we let you go? We've kept you longer than we normally do. That's a big, well, big sweatshirt, uh, no. by the way. Yeah, this is an honor of grace. Yeah, you know. that's right. Um, no, I have nothing else. I'm good. I mean, you've uh, allowed me to vent my spleen about some things, and it always starts my morning off right when I can come on here and be surrounded by incredibly intelligent and well-meaning and knowledgeable yeah. sports fans like yes. you and the rest of those clowns in that studio are. Um, and so I'm, I feel good, and I hope they feel good uh, as a result of this little fireside chat this morning. Do you guys feel good? Do you feel a little better about yourself this week, Elliot? I, Reed, I Casey? feel much better about myself. I, yes. I felt really good. We got a compliment and then immediately got called clowns. So it's just the give and the take. It's the give and the take. <laughs> I appreciate it. You got to hang. You got to hang. You got to be able to hang with the big boy. All right, Dad, thanks for the time. All right, Tom, I'll talk to you later today, okay. pal. All right, I'll talk to you later on this afternoon. And uh, I mentioned I got a chance to watch a game uh, with my dad on Sunday. Went over to, you know, Polly and I went over, had dinner with him and Amanda, watching some football, had some fried chicken, rice and beans. It's a big league operation. Oh, yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. That means she you makes rice and beans, you know, basically from scratch. I mean, she, she, it, it was the most unbelievable. It, it was so good, in fact that we took some home, and I had it for dinner last night. Good cook. Some Wednesday black night. Black beans, it's red from beans. From Sunday dinner. Red beans. Ooh, mm. That's good, too. It's you, good stuff. You know you got to watch every game with him for the rest of the year now. That's how, that's how it works. He's not home enough for me to do that. Oh, well, wherever he goes, you just got to travel. It's for the sake of the Bengals, Tom. No, that's for Casey to do. He has to have all of that stuff going on. Um, all right, we got um, – do you guys have any thoughts about the World Series, about the whole thing? We, we, we touched on it with him. Um, I, I'll tell you, you know, it, I love pitching more than offense. Uh, always have. Uh, my, my favorite guys are the pitchers and the big-time pitchers. If you watch that game last night, and I will be the first to admit, last night was the first game I watched from start to the final out. I watched the whole – it's the first baseball game I've watched in its entirety since I left the booth in August of 2020. I'll watch parts of games frequently, but never an entire game. What Nathan Avaldi did last night, inning after inning after inning, I mean, that was Schilling or Pettit or, you know, in the old days, the Drysdales, the Koufaxes, the Esque. Every inning. Guys are on base, loading the bases, runner at third, one out. Runners at second and third, one out. Bases loaded and got out of it every single time. What's amazing about Evaldi, Tom, is that for as incredible as he's been in the postseason throughout his career, he's been a good, an average to good pitcher in the regular season. He's probably a little above average. He's been a good pitcher. But when he gets in the postseason, as you mentioned, He's, he's been one of the greats. No doubt. He's been one of the greats. And well, he, his team is 11-1. That's incredible. In deciding games that he pitches in. It's incredible. Incredible. Him, Corey Seager, are, are two guys that should go down in the books as the best, some of the best postseason performers we've ever – I don't know if you've seen the, the Corey Seager stats. I know he's a two-time yeah. World Series MVP. But – He's played just as many postseason games as a guy like Reggie Jackson and has better numbers across the board. And he plays shortstop. That's, I mean, he won't get this much credit. I mean, 
he he's will. getting a lot of acclaim, but he should go down as like maybe one of the best postseason performers there, ever. There's, ever. No, there's when, no question about it. When you're thinking about Hall of Famers, how much of the postseason, like uh, Corey Seager has been a phenomenal postseason player. He, I, I'd say he's been a very, very good uh, regular season yes. player as no, well. He's been very, very good, yeah. But at the end of the day, his postseason numbers are absurdly good. How much, how much weight does that hold with the Hall of Fame committee, do you think? So when, when he gets to the Hall of Fame, there's been several Hall of Fame. Like Jack Morris is a guy that always gets brought up. He was a very good pitcher for a long time. Was he a Hall of Fame pitcher in the regular season? Not really. But mm. he was borderline. But the reason that got him over the edge was how good he was in the postseason. He yeah, but amazing. then you, but then you have, but then you have, and we talk about this guy frequently. I said his name a moment ago, just based on strict politics, strict politics. Kurt, yeah, Kurt Schilling, incredible regular season pitcher, mm-hmm. right? Even better postseason pitcher. An argument could be made, one of the top three postseason pitchers of all time, sure. both with the Philly, with with the Phillies, Arizona, and uh, Boston where he won World Series titles in Arizona and with the Red Sox. The bleeding sock, all that stuff, right? I mean, it's where you get the bias. It's politics aside of Kurt Schilling, that's why he's not in. That's exactly like, right. That's, that's, ex- that's the, the whole reason he's not in, right? Bar- Barry Bonds, all these guys, you know, it's steroids. Kurt Schilling, the only reason he's not in is because people don't like him because of his politics, which is honestly disgusting. That's right. And he's it, never been accused of being a cheater. Never, ever. In fact... He was about the only guy in baseball while the scandal was going on that called out players right. knowing they were cheating. Right. So he was never involved in that whole stuff. But to answer Elliot's question about Corey Seager getting in the Hall of Fame, listen, when you have kind of a tagline with your, with your Hall of Fame case, like, uh, like Jim Rice got in because he was the most feared hitter in the 70s, right? You look at his stats, they don't stack up to other outfielders in the Hall of Fame. But he got in because he was the most feared hitter in the 70s. When, they, when Corey Seager's time is done, they'll look and be like, this guy's one of the best postseason performers we've ever seen. He might win another World Series someday. He might, if he wins another World Series MVP, how can you leave him out? So, yeah, it, it absolutely can get you over the edge as your postseason. But Seager's got a lot of baseball left in him. Yeah, he's, he's what, a young he's not guy. Even 30. Yeah, not even 30. I mean, he, he's a young guy, and, and that's the kind of decision, you know, you wonder uh, – you know, it's interesting when teams make decisions about players, players they know that are great players and what they're going to do about it. And, and the two that stand out in about the last 20 years or so, 15 years, uh, the Dodgers not signing Seager, right. right? He was their best player at the time. Okay, now they, they've made good decisions, but they haven't won the World Series since he left. Sure. Um, and the other one is, uh, you know, when the Cardinals decided not to re-sign Albert Pujols. I mean, this was the best player in the game yeah. at the time. When, and not even, it wasn't even debatable. Right. Pujols was the most explosive offensive force in the game. And the Cardinals sat down. The DeWitts, the ownership, you know, Walt Jockety, the general manager, all those guys, or maybe Walt had already been here by now. But they had to sit down and decide, what are we going to do? This is the best player in the game. If we give him $25 million a year, well, what's that going to mean to the rest of our team and how good are we going to be? So they took all the bullets and said, we're not re-signing him. They let him go. Well, they end up winning a World Series. Right. Um, and, you know, the red sign Votto has had an incredible career, will be in the Hall of Fame one day. And now here we are at the end of that contract still talking about and people debating and everybody can have their opinion. And, and, and certainly nobody's right and nobody's wrong, or everybody's right and everybody's wrong. We're still having this opinion on what uh, this, this uh, debate about what the Reds should do now still 11 years later with Joey Votto. I mean, they are in a tough spot here. I feel for them on this thing. People have written that are much smarter than I'll ever be about the, the amount of money – uh, and, and this is debatable. It's hard to qualify or quantify that if you bring Votto back because of jersey sales, you know, and all that kind of stuff, where he cracked the top 10 this year for the first time since his MVP year. He's the first player ever in the history of the sport to go 11, 10 years between being in the top 10 in, in, in jer- uh, jersey sales. He was in it this year. And what kind of financial impact 
does Votto have coming back to the team strictly from a business standpoint? Then there's the whole baseball thing, which we just talked about a minute ago. Don't they got to decide on this? I asked my dad. Don't they have to get this behind them one way or another within the next week if they haven't already? Yeah, they do. And it's certainly going to be a distraction for a little bit until that's done. My thing is, from a baseball perspective, trying to win games, it does not make sense to bring Joey Votto back. It doesn't. Offensively, the numbers aren't there. Defensively, he's whatever. Now, saying that, if they were to bring him back, I'm not upset about it. I'm not going to sit up here and say that the Reds aren't trying to win because they give Joey Votto $7 million for the opt-out and an additional $3 million just because he's Joey Votto. I'm not going to be upset about that. I might be a little upset if they bring him back at the full salary, which is what, $26 million? $20. $20 million. So if they bring him back for the whole thing, then I might be a little upset because this is a guy that Marty said, not an everyday player. He's not. He's no longer an everyday player. And I think that's the report that came out earlier last month was basically the Reds, the Reds and Joey aren't, aren't disagreeing on salary right now. They're disagreeing on uh, his playing time, yes. what his role would be for the, for the Reds. Yep. And as of right now, his role, and I hate to say it would be something like this, but it would be almost like a, I'm not going to say a mascot, but it would be some, it, 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 it's a guy you cheer on, but you know in your heart is not going to be an avid part of this team. He's not going to produce at high levels. I think he maybe could. Maybe. I think the power's still there for Joey. But if he came back, this would be for Joey. It would, be a, it would not be for the Reds. It would, be, it would be out of respect to Joey Votto, a guy who has been with the Reds, has put up Hall of Fame numbers, and has seen uh, no winning, essentially. He's been on, what, three playoff teams? One of them happened in coronavirus, four playoff teams. So I'm not going to be upset about it. To answer your question, I think the Reds should deal with this as soon as possible. If they bring him back, I'm not going to be upset. If they get rid of him, I'm not going to be upset. Yeah. I, I don't, I, some fans are going to be upset. If they let him walk, yes, they there are going to be a lot, of ups, a, lot, a lot of upset Cincinnati Reds fans. I'm not going to be one of those people. All right. I'm going to ask you guys to uh, take it here for a minute or two. And, uh, Elliot, we got to get you over here to bring us up to speed on the weather today. Because it is a beautiful day here in Hamilton, Ohio. Chilly. You made the comment you were in a good mood for a change when you walked in today. I mean, when the red light comes on, we always know you're in a good mood. Right. Got to smile. Uh, you were in a good mood today calling it a beautiful Fall day, and then within 10 seconds, you complained about how cold it was. Tom, people that like the fall are sadists. I don't know what to tell because it is 20 degrees in the morning. It is absolutely disgusting. We're going to figure out what the weather is like right here in a second. Oh. We, got, we got Tom and a sprinter. Oh. <laughs> <over here. laughs> it's like Usain Bolt. Yeah, there we go. Are we back? Oh, let me, oh, let me get. Okay, we're here. All right, it's weather time. It's weather. I know what everybody's thinking. Elliot, you shaved the great beard. Why'd you shave it? Well, it's because it wasn't very great, and I, and I thought it looked weird. Now, I do look like somewhat of a baby face here. I, I, I can see that now. It shaved. It, it, it's, I don't like it very much. I like a little bit of something there. It covers up the... Uh, you like a butt duster. It covers up the double chin here. Yeah, what'd you say? You like a, you, you like a butt duster, a soul patch? <laughs> Never heard it that way. Never heard of a butt duster before, but I'm sure that's, that's a phrase that Reed uses. Uh, weather today... If, you, if I'm going to be honest with you, it's really cold. I had to defrost the windshield, so that really tells you all you need to know. Uh, but I'm going to look at my weather on my phone nonetheless. Uh, in Hamilton, Ohio, of course, this is not Cincinnati, Ohio. This is Hamilton, Ohio, uh, which is perhaps better than Cincinnati. 39 right now, and it's going to get up to about 52. So 39 low, 52 high, sunshine. It's going to be a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. It's an absolute beautiful day. Now, it is cold. You're going to need a, you're going to need a jacket. You're going to need a sweatshirt. I am covered with a – I'm wearing, by the way, my AJR sweatshirt today. I know Reed was giving it a glance this morning. Uh, shout out AJR, great band. But everybody, go outside. Go outside for about 10 minutes and then go back inside because it's too cold outside. But that's it. That's the weather. Uh, you don't need to go into any other forecast tonight. That's it. Sunshine. If you need to go into any other forecast, you just look at your phone. That's the bit. That's the shtick. This weather, this weather segment doesn't get old because uh, it's the same thing as every other – we- I don't know how they do that, by the way. Every single night – they do the exact same thing. They look at the little graph, and they'll go like this, and they'll say, look, it's going to do the same thing that it did yesterday. And they do it like 10 times a day on local news. It's pretty crazy to me, but whatever. Uh, Ronald Reagan, do you want it? Yeah, um, as Ronald Reagan, I, I feel informed. That, 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 did, did AJR just steal the Grateful, the Grateful Dead's bear thing? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly it, – that's – everybody – when I wear the sweatshirt – I thought you were wearing a Grateful I, Dead shirt. I didn't I, know you I were a Grateful Dead can, guy. I don't know if I can – there it is. 
So it's it's a it's a bear that's on, it's a bear that's on fire. I want to see if I can do that. So it is similar to the Grateful Dead thing. It's not exactly the same. That bear is lit. The bear, <laughs> the bear is lit, says Casey. But that's it. That's the weather. Tom, it's beautiful. It's cold. That's all there is to it. Yeah, Casey. Bring, bring, well, Tom, you can bring it to Tom. You can bring it to me because you got to do your ad reads here in a second. That's right. Either one. That's Either right, one. Casey. Let's, let's, We've got to be dialed in. All right. There we go. I mean, we have great sponsors here. Yeah, and uh, speaking of those great sponsors – We've got Encore Technologies. Encore Technologies provides IT solutions for a data-centered world with a suite of services from mobile computing to desktop to data center, supporting both centralized and work-from-home computing modules to improve efficiency and productivity. 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 You can visit Encore.tech. The path to innovation begins here. Let me tell you about this lovely bottle of water here. Pony water. Pony water is made right here in Hamilton, Ohio. It uses natural limestone filtration, unlike the artificial processing that other brands use. The result is a healthy alkaline water. The best tasting water in the world. You can visit Pony Water at P A H H N I water.com to see where you can buy this great tasting water. And for me, it's the pH level. It's not a seven, it's not a nine, it's a perfect date. It says right there, right right there on the bottle. Perfect date. Reed, what do you like about this water? Well, when you taste it, you can just taste the natural limestone filtration. That's yeah. what I love about it. It's not that artificial processing that other wa- bottles of water use. And, and then you look at the, w- the water bottle, you look at the ingredients. You know, sometimes there's some saline in there, there's some sodium. This one, just water. Just water in the bottle. Elliot? Yeah, for me, it's the smoothness. Uh, when I drink a, a nice gulp of Pawnee water and it goes down the gullet nice and smooth, that's, what, that's really what stands out for me. You drink these other waters like Kroger brand or the mountains of Fiji or wherever the hell you're getting your water from. It's not as good. The bottle is great. There's a lot of water that goes into this bottle. You drink it. It tastes great. That's Pawnee water. America's water. America's water. The world's water. The universe's water. Ooh. Go drink some water. Mmm. There are a lot of people in the chat that think you guys need some new material on this. I agree, Tom. I, I agree. mean, there really are. And I'm not going to comment on it one way or the other, but obviously you just did. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. I think we gotta I think we gotta mix up maybe just, just one of these bits here. here Which bit needs to be fixed? See the Tom. thing that Which the bit thing needs that to be I fixed? always say besides the product itself is I root for these guys because of who they are. They're right across the street. Great I see guys. them virtually every single morning. They are just good people. They really, I mean, they are really good people. And they've started this company. I'd like to really see them get in the Kroger's of the world, the UDF's of the world, because it's a great product. And, um, and I'm rooting for them. All right. Kind enough to join us from Cincinnati.com is none other than our good friend, friend of the program, Charlie Goldsmith. Charlie, good morning. How's your day so far? What's on the docket today? Are you heading over to Paycor or are you there already? I'll get there around uh, 1230, 1230 today. Okay. So when you go over there, you know, we have a lot of people that will ask me back when I was doing games about what your day is like. When you go over there, what, walk us through. You get there at what time and, and kind of then what happens over the next several hours? Yeah, I'll get there around 1215 or around 1230. I'll talk to an assistant coach or two or – um, once a week, it'll be the coordinators will come in and talk to all the media. We got a, sometimes a Zach Taylor press conference at 1. Uh, practice starts at uh, 1.30. Um, that's, you, you always gain something, even if it's just watching special teams drills. Uh, they let us watch practice for about 20 minutes. We go back in the media room for about an hour after that. Then the, the big the, the meat and potatoes of the day is the open locker room at 3.30, where we get all the interviews, talk to all the players, get all the scoops, all that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, I, I want to ask you, were you, I, I'm not going to ask you if you were surprised because it's not been the Bengals' MO about making a trade. But this year, were you surprised that they didn't make a trade? This year? No, but I think they should have made a trade. I think something that hasn't, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about tight end and we will, that is a huge piece of conversation. I don't think we've spent enough attention talking about where the Bengals are at from a running back perspective and how Travion Williams and Chris Evans really haven't done 
anything to earn a bigger role this season. And by default, they're having Drew Sample take running back snaps. They were going to play Chase Brown more, and now he's hurt with a hamstring injury. Uh, Joe Mixon had his best game in weeks because he was rested coming off the bye week. I don't know if that's going to be able to continue because of how he wore down at different stretches this year because he was playing too many snaps. I think the Bengals should have made a more aggressive move looking to add a backup running back. Yeah, I thought for sure they were going to do – I don't know why. Something in the back of my mind, even though logic would say, Tom, don't believe it, don't believe it. I, I, I'm with you. I just thought this year, because of – what are they, Charlie? A $12.5 million, something like that, under the salary cap. Mm-hmm. Okay? They, they're in this quote-unquote proverbial window you hear about all the time. But let's be honest. I mean, the team we saw Sunday uh, is a team that can win a Super Bowl. And if you have any shortcomings – whether it's offense, defense, special teams, whatever it might be, it just seems like you're not going all in to me. Is that is that fair or not fair? Yeah, and you know, I said make an aggressive move, but really what I meant was even trade just a seventh round pick to get another team's backup running back who could just be an innings eater for you, which is exactly what they need at that position. These aren't just depth guys. These are the guys who's going to be on the field for third and 10 in the two-minute drill against, say, the Chiefs in the AFC title game. Yep. Those are your most important 22 players who's on the field for those moments. That's what the season is all about, building towards those moments. Now, hey, maybe it's Tanner Hudson. Maybe Chase Brown ends up coming back from the injury and being the guy the Bengals expected. Maybe there are ways to work in Andre Yoshivash into, into a bigger role or use Charlie Jones when he comes back. But the Bengals do have obvious uh, holes on the roster. Um, when, you, when you look at the tight end situation, we know they activated or elevated to the 53-man roster, Tanner Hudson, yesterday. Do you think that that officially spells the end for Irv Smith when you get out there at practice today? Yeah. Um, I was honestly, at first, I was surprised that they didn't make this move last week. I was expecting that to happen coming out of the bye week and was surprised to see Irv continue to get that opportunity Um, As of what their plans are, they haven't specifically said, here's what I would do. I would just plug and play Tanner Hudson into Irv Smith's role and also use more four wide receiver sets. That would include Yoshivash or Irwin more consistently. Drew Sample probably would be listed as the starting tight end. He'll probably play the biggest role of that group because, you know, the consistency, the run blocking, the pass protection, all that kind of stuff will keep him in the mix. But the Bengals need a reception out of their tight ends. I think Tanner should and will be the guy they go to going forward. Okay. Do you think that that means they just cut Irv Smith? So they don't need to cut Irv Smith now. In football, you keep as much depth as you can for as long as you can. So if you can keep him around in the background, keep him inactive, who knows? Maybe he is inactive and Tanner is not on Sunday, but that seems much less likely. What I would do is have Tanner kind of fill that role and then have Irv be inactive. Okay. Um, I want to shift gears. Uh, well, I know I want to ask you one thing because I'm just curious your thoughts about this. Um, I read the question that was asked of Sean McDermott yesterday uh, in relation to uh, DeMar Hamlin. And you were there last year. Many watching were there last year. All of us were watching on television at the minimum last year when this young man almost died on the field at Paycor Stadium. He's come all the way back, thank God. And thank you for the help for so many people here in Cincinnati medically and, and around the country, but especially here. He's playing again. Uh, he's only been active one game. Um, do, do, you, do you think at the end of the day it would be a good thing or a bad thing? I know McDermott said it would it'd be strictly a football decision, not an emotional decision. But, 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 but look, all of these coaches are looking for an edge, man. Any little thing they can find, right? Um, do you think it makes sense to make sure this guy's on the field? I think it would be an advantage for Buffalo to have him on that field strictly from a psychological standpoint. I hadn't considered the psychological standpoint. What what you do see around the NFL every week is you see guys who who aren't active or aren't in the mix usually get called up. And the big like the, the Bengals had it with Kwame Lasseter a couple weeks ago. And the biggest thing everyone, Kwame himself, the coaches, his teammates, stress in that situation is they don't want this to feel like it's a, a charity is the word Joe Burrow used. He said he didn't throw that pass to Kwame Lasseter in the stadium that Kwame's late father used to play to him uh, because it'd be a good story and because it would boost the team. 
he did it because that was the right read to make on the play. And I think in football, you know, in a way that's respectful and, you know, just recognizes DeMar as who he is, which is a backup safety, I think what would make the most sense would just to keep doing the things you're doing just so it's not like he's out there for almost emotional reasons, just because that usually isn't how these decisions get made in yeah. the NFL. Yeah, yeah. I want to shift gears real quick to baseball for a second. We, we had my dad on a little while ago, and we're talking about now that the World Series is over, uh, teams have five days to start making major, major decisions. And look, we, we've asked you about this before. Um, well, well, let me ask you this. Don't you think that the Reds have to make a decision one way or the other and get this thing behind them or directly in front of them on what they're going to do with Votto? They, that will be the first decision they make. You know, literally, they have a timeline. They have five days to make these decisions, and you can't sign external free agents until six days from now. So that will be the first decision they make. Um, Nick Kroll said, you know, as recently as last week or two weeks ago, that they hadn't talked to Votto yet. I think they were waiting for the World Series and really for some time between the regular season to end and the off season to begin. So it wasn't the so the emotions of the way the season ended weren't fresh for everyone. They wanted some distance and some clarity before they had those conversations. I don't expect the option to be picked up. Um, the reason I expect or don't expect that is because Votto didn't play a lot during the last two weeks of the season when the Reds were in the thick of a playoff. On is worth so much to the Reds, but you look at where his role was compared to a Strand or a Marte. I'd be really interested to hear next, what does Votto want? How many at-bats? What kind of role would he want to sign up for, whether that's with the Reds or somewhere else? He hasn't quite given that answer clearly yet. I think that'll be kind of the next phase of the conversation when you look at where he's going to be playing next year. You know, I, I don't think there is any debate whatsoever because Votto, you know, he knows his body. He knows himself. I think he's quite honest with himself when he looks in the mirror about what he can do and he can't do. And we have heard him say that he very much believes that he can still compete at the very highest level on a regular basis. What's your gut tell you at the end of the day about how this thing ends up? <sighs> I, I just don't know where the outside market is. So like if you're the if you're the Padres, the Padres had the worst production of first baseman in all of baseball last year. Votto was just slightly below league average for a first baseman. You bring Votto in to fix your culture, give you some about below average hitting, a little left-handed punch to the lineup. Or if you're the Padres and you just had as much of an underperforming year as you had, do you feel like you need to make a little bit more of an upgrade with that and get a, a first baseman with a bit higher of an upside? I don't know how they viewed that. If you're the Blue Jays, Brandon Belt, do you want Brandon Belt, who I would project would have a better year next year than Joey Votto? Or do you want Joey Votto? How do they view that situation? That kind of seems to be an important uh, variable as well, because depending on how other teams view Votto, that'll impact what type of role Votto can expect around the league next year, which would impact what he'd be willing to accept in a place like Cincinnati. Um, so I think the next step is touching base with Votto. What type of role do you want around the league? What type of role do you see Votto playing? And then kind of circle back from there. All right, I asked my dad this question. I'll pose the same question to you. Uh, the Reds made a lot more money this year than they thought they were ever going to make. I mean, they had sellout crowds on a regular basis after the team proved it was going to be in contention, uh, starting really back at the end of May, early June. Uh, and, and, I mean, they were packing them in there. You got Moustakas off the books. You got, theoretically, Votto off the books. You've got Bronson Arroyo off the books. I think you got Griffey for another year or two. Um, should Red, Reds fans expect this team to go out and spend money? I don't mean Steve Cohen, New York Mets money. But should Reds fans expect this franchise to go out and spend money to be a bona fide contender looking ahead to 2024? I don't think they're going to do as much right now as they did in 2020. I don't think they're going to plant their flag, which is what they did, which is when they got Moustakis, Castellanos, Wade Miley, Shogo Akiyama. I think there was some lessons learned from the Reds because when those contracts didn't work out, to get back under the payroll they had, they had to trade all these good, you know, popular players um, and ended up in a massive rebuild. I think they want to sign contracts that give them more flexibility. But yes, they will spend. I don't think they'll spend to that extent, but I think it'll be an upgraded version of what they did um, last offseason. Who is, you know, the plus Will Myers tier of starting pitcher? 
Um, is there a right-handed hitting platoon bat? A Michael A. Taylor, Kevin Kiermaier, guys like that. On the pitcher side, Seth Lugo, Kyle Gibson, a useful major league guys who have played in hundreds of more games than their teammates, uh, who their teammates would be on the Reds roster. That tier, that type of guy seems to make a lot of sense. That They don't have the money to go out and get Aaron Nola, uh, most likely considering how intense that market's going to be. But they can still make some nice, solid, useful moves to add value to the roster. All right. Fellas, anything for uh, Mr. Goldsmith before we let him roll? He's a busy man. He is a very busy man, and if you'll indulge me, i got to ask him one silly question, and that is, uh, listen, I'm, uh, I'm the biggest supporter of Drew Sample, I think, in the world, in the entire world. I, I think that when we drafted him in the second round, that was a steal. I think oh he's by I see, I see better. I see the game better than anybody. Yeah, you must. And uh, I understand that he's the, he's the best tight end in the league. How many offers – of first-round picks and future first-round picks, did the Bengals have to turn down for Drew Sample yesterday? Um, this, is it, it, this is really interesting. Like, what was fascinating <laughs> to me was Drew Sample's free agency process. Like, he 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 went on visits. He looked around the league. There was a market for Drew Sample to sign a, uh, As there and be. ended up being like a one or two million dollar deal. As it should be. As it should be. I'm just excited to see uh, to see Drew lead this team to the promised land, Charlie. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh charlie i'm sorry uh, uh, uh zebra yeah I, I just have i just have a quick one charlie you said they're not going to do the the 2020 thing or the 2019 thing they're not going to get mike uh, mike moustakis nick castiano sugar they're not, they're not going to go all out and, and i think that's fair uh what, what what would you say right now if, if charlie had a wish list and you're looking at this reds what they need in my personal opinion i need one veteran starter in there because if you, if you go through the lineup, if you go through the batting order, you look around the field, the infield's already filled, and the outfield's mostly filled. Other than that, I think the Reds need one veteran arm, even though you could argue that they have five starters right now. But in my humble opinion, I think they need one veteran arm uh, in the bullpen, and then they need one veteran arm starting. And maybe if I, if I, had, to, if I had to throw one wish out, it would be Cody, Cody Bellinger. Uh, but other than that, that's it for me. What's so interesting is the the veteran free agent pitching market is like the hardest to predict free agent market in sports. Like I think last year, if you look at guys in a certain tier of guys where the Reds could spend, like four of the 16 ended up being even halfway decent um, and, give, and gave the teams even halfway what they were expecting. So it's a tricky market. Is a trade a better avenue to add that type of pitcher? It would be a younger pitcher. Um, Cody Bellinger, Cody Bellinger is going to have a heck of a market. Um, the Reds also have a lot of left-handed hitting outfielders, but it's a really deep right-handed hitting outfielder class. You yeah. Michael A. Taylor, Kevin Meyer, Adam Duvall, A.J. Pollock. I'm forgetting a bunch of names. There, there's a nice, solid group of guys there who I think could you know, be a platoon with Fraley or add some depth overall to that part of the roster. All okay. right, last thing, Casey. Anything for Mr. Goldsmith? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just looking at the Bengals injury report here, and – are any of these injuries serious? Like Trey Hendrickson, I think, has a foot injury. I thought we all thought that might have been like an ankle injury. Orlando Brown is still dealing with that groin, I'm assuming. And then Joe Mixon, his chest. What was? What's that about? I, I don't have any new information on Mixon's chest. That'll be important. I, I, that wasn't on my radar until he popped up on the injury report last night. Um, Tyson Anderson's one I have my eye on. Um, Brian Callahan was talking about signing Hudson, and he said they had some roster space because of Anderson's injury, which previously wasn't on our radar. Uh, so it seems like there's something there. Uh, Mixon will be important to get some more information on. Uh, Orlando Brown's been playing through it. He played great on Sunday. They'll manage him. Uh, same with Trey Hendrickson. Zach Taylor said he expects him to go on Sunday. All right. There you have it. There you have it. The man, he, I mean, he knows it. Baseball, football, he's got it all dialed in. Charlie Goldsmith, we thank you for your time, my friend. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Charlie Goldsmith. The guy's dialed in. Yes, he is. I mean, he is dialed in. Yes, he is. That is the best, that is the best sports writer in this city, Barnett. Yeah, he's on it. He is totally on his game. Both teams. And, you know, that's hard to do. Uh, I, I've thought about him frequently in, in about the last number of months when he'll, you know, if the Reds are out of town, he won't travel. He does sometimes, but, he's, you know, sometimes he won't. And, and then he'll bounce over to a Bengals mini camp. And then he'll come back when the Reds get home. And, and, and back and forth, and now he's primarily, not exclusively, primarily on the Bengals' beat. But that's hard to develop uh, the kind of relationships that he's developed clearly with both of those franchises and people inside of them. They trust the guy. 
And that's where it all starts. No doubt. No doubt about it. Yeah, he's on it. Before we move on, I just want to say really quickly one thing. We don't do this enough on the show. Like the stream because like we it. have we have 160 people in here and only 39 likes. Come on, folks. Well, maybe they don't like it. I mean, are you begging for likes? If they like the show, then like it. Maybe they don't <laughs> like it. Well, what if they, they don't, don't like know? It. What if they just Is forgot that not today? fair? Tom, what if they <laughs> just know. forgot to like it today? I Listen, if... if <laughs> What the hell's so funny? All well, I said it, was well, maybe just, they was, don't like it. You're allowed to say, hey, you know what? I'm watching this show. I'm killing time at work. Eh. <laughs> well, that's eh. not good. We it's can't like my be wife. Eh. Well, Don't it's give them the so opportunity we, not to like it. You guys got to like it. Yeah, we, we got to get those likes so that we can grow. We want the show to grow. We want to nurture it. And each like is like a little raindrop falling on our on our plant of off the bench. And See, now this is where I would growing. unlike it. When you started talking about raindrops, and that's where I would have unliked it there. <laughs> but that's that's just me personally. I would have un, I would have taken my check that I liked, boom, off. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, uh, Sir Boy Wonder tells me that Tom doesn't know, quote unquote, client outreach. This has nothing to do with client outreach. It has everything to do with client outreach. No, it doesn't. Yes, because it if somebody <laughs> wants to click, they like the show, we are very thankful and grateful. But there are people, mark it down, that are watching the show that are going, oh, yeah, I liked hearing Marty, liked hearing Charlie, liked hearing some of the bits and that, but uh, to click like, eh, I don't know. And Casey, ever since you liked it, you asked for it, we're up to what, 54 now? Yep, we're getting those we likes. Anymore? Where would you like to see us be? I would like to see this show get to 75 to 100 likes every show. We get close to 100 to 100 or not 100 we get close to like 125 150 people every show concurrently that are in the chat that are in the chat yeah and those that drop in that uh, aren't watching the show that like it afterwards we got to get more likes that's just the way it is and if you're by the way this is just not for the the people who watch it live because a lot of our listeners come from after the show the, true. the, the live true. show is just a part of it the the after the show if you're if you're watching it uh post-produced if you're watching it later tonight Click the likey button. Click it. Just click it. That's all I ask. That's it. Uh, we do have a mailbag. If yeah. anybody wants to get to the mailbag, oh my we gosh. got a big I mailbag. have finally gotten to the point the last few, last couple of days, not even two full days, less than 48 hours, where I haven't walked around all day singing what has become one of the most popular jingles that you can find on TV slash streaming in America. Hit it. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. I wonder who it's from. Well, how about that? Everybody's singing along. It's everybody's favorite segment. It's time for the mailbag. That is let's, an awesome yeah. song. let's see. We had we had thousands of letters sent in, uh, and we and I picked this one. This okay. is a good one. All right, who's it from? So today's mailbag comes from sweet little Ted. Uh, Ted. From, Ted from Mrs. Cruz's class. Ted is a second grader on the honor roll. However, he does so by running the most elaborate cheating ring of all time. <laughs> he uses an elaborate system of buzzers and pulleys with his best friend Mike from Mrs. Pence's class. And these two run the greatest cheating ring of all time. Now, they're very honest about it. They're in second grade. They have yet to be caught. So if Mrs. Cruz or Mrs. Pence is watching this, don't get them in trouble. Everything they write in these letters is confidential, except to all the people who watch this. They want to know, uh, yeah. little Ted does, yeah. what is the worst case of cheating in sports history? The worst cheating scandal in the history of sports. Ooh. So you, you, got, you got the Black Sox, you got the Astros, you got Michigan. I mean, there's so many good cheaters out there. Spygate. Spygate is yeah, a great one. The, uh, the, the deflated ball gate. Yeah, I, I, my personal favorite. Was, was the Black Sox cheating? Yeah, it's cheating. That's cheating. I'm sure it is. Okay. They, they were trying not to win games, so yeah. I'd that's cheating the book. I would that's say that's the, the most well-known. That uh, seems okay. to have this extended shelf life that's better, well better now than 100 years. It's 105 years. Yeah. So I, I think that one is the most well-known. If you, if you ask 25 to 80, right, age group. Yeah. Now, for your generation, what do you guys think it is? Uh, I'm going to throw, you know, you, you mentioned the ones with the Patriots and everything like that. I'm going to throw um, Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong is a great Lance one. Lance Armstrong, no, yeah, that's a good one. Right. That's, that's one. right up there, no doubt. 
I'm yeah. gonna go. I'm gonna go Bounty Gate for mine. It's a case of cheating where obviously Sean Payton and the boys were, were paying players, incentivizing, hurting other athletes. I think that's one of the worst cases of cheating uh, of all time, especially in terms of a, in terms of a uh, health and a safety standpoint. But how is that cheating in, in, in that thing? Because I, that's more like of a, a, of a, a, a pay to hurt somebody kind of a thing. Right. Yeah, well, but I, I, I think you're but cheating. But by the, trying to hurt somebody, it's cheating. You're cheating the okay. integrity of the okay. game. Okay. Yeah. All right, fair enough. You're, fair trying, enough. To take, you're t- trying to take out their best players so they're unable to compete. That's fair. Balco, like all the steroid stuff, obviously, is up there too. Right? Ooh, I mean, it's hard to that, imagine that anything's bigger than that. Right. Can I have a take? <laughs> and and Tom, I think Tom's going to disagree with me. Tom's going to disagree with me here. I don't think the steroid stuff in baseball is bad. I don't think it's that bad. I think I, I would argue steroids saved baseball when it happened in the '90s. So would you? So would you? Then, I, I, would not, you then agree what Lance Armstrong did was bad? Ha! Uh, it's the exact same thing. It is. It is. Ooh, it is. So I'm, I'm caught in a pretzel. I, like, but when somebody looks at me and says Barry Bonds doesn't deserve it because he cheated. I think Barry Bonds still puts up those numbers if he didn't cheat. I don't know if he's hitting 490. You don't think so? Well, he's still he was still a Hall of Fame player, but he's not hitting 73 home runs. He's yeah. not he's not having a 1.5 OPS without cheating. He's not breaking the all-time home run. Right. right. He's not doing sure. that. Like he's he yeah. he was a fantastic player. Like he would have been one of the greats without it, but still and on top of steroids helped the longevity of his career. Like he's he was 40 years old hitting 40 home runs. That doesn't happen. That shouldn't happen. That's fair. I mean, Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge just hit sixty. What sixty three of them, and there was no steroids involved there. So I, I'm just saying, I think he could have done it. Chi Town Real Estate so, with a two dollar super chat. He says the 1919 Black Sox scandal was a workers' rights protester strike because the reason that they did do that was because they felt like they were underpaid. Yep. Yeah. So they were trying to to shove it to Comiskey. So uh, I, yeah, bef- I mean, I got to tell you, you know, I've forgotten about. It. The Lance Armstrong thing, I think, I think was just so much that he had gone on and on and on and on. About he never, it the right yeah, way, yeah, right, yeah, right. and all that kind of thing, and all the <laughs> money he made from selling all his merchandise and all that kind of thing. So, a cancer survivor, right? All that kind of thing. So I, I decided that I was going to look it up just to see some different options, right? There was Spygate as one of the worst ones, um, Lance Armstrong's doping, Russia and the Olympics doping. Yeah. But one for me that took the cake – there was cheating that happened in the Paralympics in 2000. Spain had an all non-disabled basketball team win gold. What? I've never heard of that one. Yeah, that is wild. That, now that's brutal. Ten out of the 12 basketball that's players tough. were that's not intellectually brutal. disabled. That's, tough. that's brutal. That's a, that's a brutal one. That's my, that's my top one, just so we're clear. That's a wild one. My buddy plays for the, the National uh, Paralympic rugby team. Mm. Yeah, Travis Baker. So phenomenally yeah. dedicated athletes. Dude, they they're in it. They're, they're, they're in it to win it, man. You're right. They're they're on top. I of mean, it. They, they may have lost a part of their body that no longer works or their mind or whatever it might be, but the competitive part has never been gone. In fact, may have been inflated. He, he was he was he played high school baseball with me and he was one of the most competitive people I've ever met. Anything he did. And it was no surprise at all that after his accident that he would immediately um, devote his, his life into Paralympic um, sports. You know, it's interesting where, where some of the comments made in the chat, and, and Molly, who's with us frequently, and we thank her for being with us a lot. But, you know, th- there's that age-old adage out there uh, about, you know, y- you know, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. And it's sort of, you know, it's used as a, a throw line. And here is that um, comment made a minute ago. Super chat. Um, and we thank you for that. But, you know, th- this kind of goes hand in hand with s- sort of two things that are going on right now. And, I mean, you couldn't, you, you, you couldn't have more night and day. And you have to ask yourself the question. And I'm not going to sit here and try to preach to you and tell you on which side you want to be on. I'm not going to do it because some people will say, well, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Everybody else is cheating, so that means we got to do it. So here you have, let's just say on one end of the spectrum, you have this whole thing going down at Michigan, okay? Or allegedly going down at Michigan. And then over here, you have Bob Knight, who used to call out other coaches 
that he knew were cheating. Mm -hmm. And he would just say it to anybody that would listen. Anybody. And, I mean, he dared anybody to run a fine-tooth comb through his program. He nearly had a 100% graduation rate for every kid over 29 years that played for him at Indiana and then for eight years at Texas Tech. And, of course, all of them graduated when he was at Army, his first job. You know, but, but, but then you start saying, well, there are a lot of holes I can poke into Bobby Knight for different things that he did and different ways that he acted and throwing the chair in the game against Purdue, uh, walking off the court in the exhibition game against uh, the Soviet Union uh, at, at, at uh, Assembly Hall in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, the, the allegations that were proven true, that he grabbed Neil Reed, a player of his in the 1990s, by the throat during practice one day. Some of the comments he made about women um, in, a, in one of the most famous interviews of all time by Connie Chung at NBC News. Uh, he just said some terrible things. But if you, if you had to come on or come in and land on one or the other, where do you land? Bobby Knight or Michigan? I, and, and I think that's the debate. I think Tom Izzo kind of gets a bad rap, too, uh, not to the extent of Bobby Knight. But uh, I, you, you, there's a video of, <clears throat> of Tom Izzo screaming at every player he has on the sidelines every game. And people are like, why is Tom Izzo yelling at this kid like this? It's just I, I do think there is a point of um, being a uh, – I don't want to say a strict parent, but it's, when you're a coach, it's almost like that a little bit. You're, you're disciplining them in a different way, but it's it's still almost like they're your parent in, in a weird sense. Uh, so yeah, I would say, I would say Bobby Knight. I, I I bet he loved all of his all all the all the kids that came through. There's no Indiana. Doubt. So it's hard for me not to say Bobby Knight would probably be the better option. I don't know though. It, listen, the thing when it comes to to very strict coaches, I mean Bobby Knight's the you know kind of the one that's on the pedestal on on yep. guys that are you know, yelling in your face kind of coaches, is that if you are tough enough, if you have the, the, the mental capabilities, which not everyone has, like not everyone jives with that style. If you can, if you get through it and come out of this, people rave about Bob Knight that played for him. Absolutely. They love him. Yep. They absolutely yes, adore they him. And that's a big part of that article today in The Athletic. They absolutely adore him. So if you can get through it, right, if, if you come out on the other side, you are – a changed man. Yep. And, and maybe it's not the perfect way to go about coaching, and there's there's a billion ways to go about it, but if you do come out on the other side, you have such a reverence for the coach that got you there, right? You are a different man because of them. And that's why Bob Knight has, despite having all these all these things that have happened that, that you know, he admits that he, he did things wrong. Despite all that, people still revere Bob Knight because – he does have love for these players. He, he wants these men to be better men. He wants his athletes to be better men. And that's what it all comes down to, right? You, 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 you have a way that you hold yourself accountable and you have a way that you hold your athletes accountable and try to make them better men. Yeah. And I think I, I have an example. I was, I was a soccer player for a long time, pretty much my entire life until high school. Um, so all throughout grade school I was. And I had a coach named Luke Badgero. And, and a lot of the parents didn't like him. A lot of the parents were complaining to uh, – I played for TFA. So they would complain to TFA. they say, this coach isn't very good. He's, make, he's harder on our kids. He's running us. He was my favorite coach to this day. He was at my absolute favorite coach because as much – as much I don't know, pain, if you want to say it like that, as much pain he caused us, making us run sprints nonstop and, and working us, he still had respect for us. And I think there's a difference uh, – and I don't want to throw any shade here, but a little bit of shade – John Brannon, I think, was a, is a tough coach. He came to UC, and I think he treaded that line of not having respect and just being tough. I don't know for sure, but that's, that's all the reports, at least, that I've read. Uh, when, when you cross over that I don't respect you line, um, that's kind of where it gets lost. I'm not saying he didn't. That's just the reports that I've read. Uh, but Bob Knight, I think he respected and he cared for all the players that came through him. So having a tough coach like that, like Reed said, it makes you admire him so much more. The funny, the funny thing is, though, is if you don't win – that that style of coaching, I mean, you could you could throw it by the wayside. So you got to win, which Bob Knight did a lot of, right? If if a coach is like John Brandon, he didn't win a whole lot. He didn't have a whole lot of time to yeah. to develop it. 
But, you know, if John Brandon's winning the, the conference, then, yeah, you're like, this, this is just the way it is. This is the method to the madness. But Belichick, right? Belichick's like this way, but it wins. So it's all about winning and losing at the end of it all. Yep. But I don't think we're ever going to see uh, another coach like him uh, ever again because it really it comes down to what you guys just pointed out. It comes down to the parents. No. And, I mean, I can just speak to this just from my very limited experience of being a coach of both of my kids, son and daughter, in basketball. They, they don't – so many of the ones that have the little guys now – and when I'm saying little guys, I'm not talking infants here. I'm talking about the ones that are, that are now the parents of the – seven, eight, nine, ten year old. They don't want little Johnny or little Sally. They don't want them pushed. And I mean pushed to being more than they thought. It's like the old Navy SEAL adage, right? Just when you think you're done, you've got another 20% left in your body, your mind, your spirit. You think you're done but you have 20% more left. You got to keep rolling. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second you're choking players and you're doing grabbing their jerseys. And stuff. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying pushing someone and demanding excellence, demanding concentration, demanding effort. I see it every single day. Every single day. Living in a neighborhood where there are lots of little kids that are getting coached, some that are playing select soccer, select basketball, even when you're paying for that, select baseball, select lacrosse. You don't want to hear anymore somebody yelling at little Johnny, telling him to get his act together, jerking him off the field out of the game. Parents don't want to see it. They just don't want to see it. And that's where I, I, I think it, that there, there is clearly – um, a middle ground there. It doesn't have to be necessarily all Bob Knight style. But what's wrong with demanding effort and excellence? And if you don't get it, you sit them down. What's wrong with that? As long as you're showing them, and you brought up the word respect, if a kid knows, and one of my greatest joys in life was when I coached those basketball teams, and when those kids would get in high school, their parents would come up to me at halftime of football games that they're playing in high school football games. And they'd come up to me in the stands and say, hey, when Mark walks off the field, can you go jump his ass? And I'm looking at her like, this is a mom. I'm looking at her like, are you kidding me? I'm not the coach. I'm not going down there and jumping Mark's ass because he's playing poorly in a high school football. Right. I'm not, it's not my place. Right. But the point was is that – if the kids know you care about them, and this can be seven-year-old soccer players, like you're pointing out, Elliot, it can be 12-year-old baseball players, it can be 15-year-old football players, it can be 21-year-old basketball players, it can be anything across the board, boy or girl. If the kid knows, and they know, it's like the UC brand, the kids know. And the kids knew who played for Bob Knight that at the end of the day, it kind of been your theme, if I come out on the other side, that he's not doing these things to punish me or embarrass me or whatever. This guy genuinely cares about me. He only wants to see me be the best version of me. Mm -hmm. And he's seen how to do that with thousands and thousands of kids throughout his coaching life. We're not asking coaches to be like that anymore. We don't want them to be like that anymore. The only common theme between then and now is you expect them to win. So, you know what's one, one interesting thing about the way that those, like the, these coaches um, style is, uh, first off, all of this doesn't work if you don't find a, a, a love, right? If, That's if you right. Don't, if you don't find a connection, because then it just feels like you're, you're, you are punishing any kid unless they know that there is a sense of love there, unless yep. you, you understand that they're trying to make you better. But – one thing that I've noticed about that coaches and, and, and the few that I've had through athletics and the few that I've been around in my brothers and cousins and all of them they coach um, is that they are hardest on the best players on the team. That's right. Anyone can beat up. And, and you say this when you when I do the Drew Sample bid and he's like, I'm hard on, on Joe Burrow. You're hard on Drew Sample. Anyone can you, – you, you, can, you can pick at the guys that aren't very good, right? 
But well, of course, that's the easiest thing in the world. It's the easy to do. thing to do, but right. that doesn't do any, that doesn't do the team any good, right? Everyone can see that they're struggling. What you need to do is you need to li- listen. If you're going to be the best player on this team, people look up to you because you're the best player on the team. I'm going to be a little harder on you because I expect more out of you. That's what the best coaches do. They are hardest on the best players because that's what's hard to do. That's right. That's what's hard to do. Well, that's why when they talked about, again, I keep getting back to this article because I really believe this is something that is very much worth reading and at least opening your mind. You might be the, 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 the biggest critic and be against everything that Bobby Knight stood for. And he gave you reasons to feel that way. He gave you reasons to feel that way. But Seth Davis, I just got a text from him two seconds ago. I sent him a text today and I said, Seth, Maybe the best single written story I have ever read. And I read a lot. It's the best written story I've ever read. And it's the entire Bobby Knight story. And it'll take you a while to read it. It gets into the good and the bad. When you, when, when you get finished reading the article, this isn't like some political show you might be watching where you know exactly where he stands on his opinion about this topic or this guy. You will have no idea where he stands. But you will get the entire breadth of what Bobby Knight was. And with his passing, will we ever see anybody like him again in American sports or American society? It's a legitimate question. Um, I don't know if we have a couple other things we want to do today. I will say that for about the last eight or ten minutes of the program today, I am going to share some stories about Bobby Knight that I have personally uh, because I did get to know him. I know his son very well, Tim Knight. Uh, He and I were going back and forth last night, one of his two sons. um, And some things that Bob Knight did for me that I never knew about. And there was no reason for him to ever do it. So I'll get into that about the last uh, ten minutes of the show. What else do we have, if anything, on the docket? Haro has a $5 super chat. He asks, uh, Tom, who's the most famous person you've texted? Ooh. Most famous person I've – well, I mean, I think when you start uh, – get it, Sharon, come on. When you start um, – <laughs> it's not Jenna Jameson. Um, <laughs> although that's not a bad idea. Um, but, no, but, but uh, you know, it's a good question. I, I said to my wife last night, we're sitting there, and, and uh, the baseball game was on, and my wife's born and raised in Arizona. And she worked at the Diamondbacks. That's where we first met one another. And we got married in Arizona. Kids were born in Arizona, baptized in Arizona. We lived there a long time. She's born and raised there. So she's a huge Diamondbacks fan. Um, and so we're sitting there last night, and, and – when I found out that Bobby Knight died, I, you know, I started just kind of sitting there. Yeah, the game was on, but I clearly was not even engaged in the game. I started to think about, you know, a couple of things, and this happens to a lot of us. When you start getting into your, you know, now I'm 60. I just turned 60 a month ago. Um, and when you start seeing people die, that you've not only just known who they were, but you actually had a chance to be around them to a greater or lesser extent, depending on who you're talking about. And I started thinking back to some of the people I have been blessed to meet in my life, even if it's only for 10 minutes. It's just unbelievable. The people that I've had a chance to meet, and I'm not sitting here bragging about myself or trying to sound like some important guy. I say this with with incredible uh, humbleness. I mean, you know, I mean, last year I'm down in Florida and there's a guy in a dog park out throwing a, base, uh, throwing a ball for his dog. We're the only two guys at the dog park. I walk out there, it's George W. Bush. <laughs> no way. The next day I go to the same dog park, there's a guy out throwing a ball for his dog. I walk over to him. Hey, how you doing? Turns around, he's got on this Iowa Hawkeyes baseball cap. It's Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw. And from that day on, he and I have been emailing each other going back. And Tom Brokaw. I mean, I watched this guy when I was a little kid on the nightly news. But when you see these guys start to die, man, it's hard to watch. Now, for guys like my dad's age, you really start to see him die. But we had this conversation with some friends 
some couples we had get together over the weekend that, man, you start seeing this kind of thing and people you know that die. So the most famous person I ever, oh, th- th- that ask ever texted, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Who's the most famous person in your Rolodex? Oh, geez. That's a good question. Um, Any presidents in there? No, no presidents in there. Um, um, boy, I'd have to think about that for a little bit. It would certainly be somebody, without a doubt, I would think, in the world of sports. I'd have to think about that a little bit. Yeah. You, you meet any other presidents? You said you met George W. Uh, yes, met his dad one time. Um, is that it? I think that's, I think that's it. Even though I didn't, I, I, wouldn't vote, I didn't vote for the guy. The guy that I really wanted to meet, I hope I do get a chance to meet him sometime, is Clinton. Uh, you does. know, uh, because I, I've met a lot of people who uh, – have been around him. I remember when Jimmy Leland was managing um, with the Rockies. And he came out. And we played golf one day out in Arizona when they were in town playing the Diamondbacks. And he had told me that on the road trip prior, they were somewhere. It might have been D.C., maybe. No, I don't think they Yeah. Yeah, Nationals would have been around by then. Um, that he had a chance to play golf with Bill Clinton. And he, he said it was the most incredible four hours of his life. <laughs> he just said, awesome dude. Awesome dude. And I always, that always kind of stuck in my mind that, you know, yeah, wish you could have had a chance to meet him. All right, what else we got going on? Well, I'll, I'll just, try to think about who that is. Before we get into your Bobby Knight story, Ed, one thing, there is now rumors uh, swirling on X.com that Jim Harbaugh is keeping tabs if there is an opening with the Chicago Bears. So That's I, looks, not a surprise. It looks, like, you want to go to the Bears? it looks like Jimmy Boy might be looking for a way out. Uh, either way, no matter what happens with this, is this the end of Jim Harbaugh at Michigan this season? I asked yes. this question yesterday. I think, it, I think this season, you, you, Tom, you think that there will be uh, a punishment brought down during season. I think that it won't be during season just because I think the NCAA is a little slow. I think the Big Ten doesn't want to hurt one of their big, big products in season. Um, but – the person that should get in the most trouble is going to just walk to the NFL. Mm-hmm. Like, the person that oversees this whole thing, this whole, this whole cheating scandal, is just going to get a job in the NFL. Yep. And it'll probably be very successful, and in two years we'll forget all about it, just like we did with Pete Carroll, like we, did, like we would. Right? I mean, it's just, it's just what's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, and I did meet Trump. I met him. You met Trump. You met Trump Trump. before president. Before he was president. When he was running for president. Really? Yes. Right here in Cincinnati. About that. Yes. No Reagan. No. No. No no. Clinton. No. No Barry O. No. 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 Met Hillary. Um, Yeah, but uh, didn't meet Trump. Any vice presidents? Pence. Yeah, I mean, I used to see on. I I used to see uh, uh, not on a regular basis, but a semi-regular basis, quite frequently. Um, Dan Quayle. Okay. Because he was vice president, of course, uh, and he lives in Arizona. Okay. So I was out there. He used to come to a lot of baseball games um, and a lot of Diamondbacks games. And so, yeah, uh, I had a chance to meet him. Any other vice presidents trying to think? Uh, Kamala hasn't called. Um, <laughs> don't suspect she will. Anyway, I think Gore. that's about it. Gore. Uh, no, definitely not Gore. <laughs> and real quick, Harrow has. Jamie, definitely not Gore. Biden. Harrow has another super chat. Prediction from each of you guys, Harbaugh's fate at the end of this. I think they will bring the hammer of justice on Michigan, on the Michigan football program. Harbaugh will be suspended or punished. I don't think they'll fire him. I think he will leave on his own merit and he will head to the NFL. So the question is. So is, wait, wait, real quick. I want to interrupt because Reed has said what he thinks. Do you think they, that he gets punished before the end of this season? Will they play in the Big Ten championship game if they earn their way there, or if they, they earn their way to a college football playoff, will they be playing? Yes. Yes, they will. The, the punishment will not come this season. I say no. So the question is, is uh, like, how badly do they want to punish? Because if Jim Harbaugh leaves, right, and, and, it, and it seems likely that he's going to step down and they're going to hire some other coach, that program's going to take a hit for a couple oh, of years. Oh, boy. Just, just from him leaving. Yeah. So what more do they have to do other than just saying, like, oh, you got to get rid of Harbaugh? Because it feels like any other punishments just seems like overkill at that point. I don't know. I don't know. Because you don't, like like we said, this is a, a moneymaker for the Big Ten. This is a moneymaker for college football. You don't want to, damn it, you don't want to just say it's it's forever gone. Like we've seen, no. like like my, Miami was was bad for decades and still to this day because of what happened there. 
So is is Harbaugh leaving enough of a enough of a punishment? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, well, I I I, 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 I don't think there's any doubt that that they that the I mean, look, whether it's a Big Ten or the NCAA, they are well aware of a couple of things here, and uh, you know, the, we thank you for the chat very much, Haro. Is They do take into consideration the kids who are there now and playing. And they're going to say, well, it wasn't their fault. Well, I brought up yesterday, if they're complicit in any form or fashion to take advantage of this cheating, are they not complicit? Right. Okay, well, okay, you get into the whole thing there. And, and, and believe me, the NCAA is well aware that the scenario you just painted, where Harbaugh walks out the door, becomes a head coach in the NFL. He's getting paid eight, nine, ten, twelve million dollars a year, right? And just leaves wasteland behind him, right? Well, you can take it to the bank that the NCAA is then going to hand down punishment for Michigan, okay? Because, yeah, Harbaugh is responsible for overseeing the football program, but the athletic director is responsible for overseeing the athletic department, and the president, the former UC president, Santa Ono, he's there now at Michigan, right? right? Yep, right. He's responsible for everything going on underneath him, whether he knew anything or not. I'm sure he didn't. So um, there are going to be penalties. If, again, and Elliot said this yesterday, I, 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 I'm not getting ahead of myself on this because at the end of the day, you still got to prove it, right? I mean, you still really – you have to prove. And ultimately, it's going to come down to – it's going to come down to a money trail or an information trail is what it's going to come to because they got all the information they need about the tickets, him going to the games, him buying the tickets to the games, all this kind of thing on a $55,000 a year salary. It would be impossible to afford that and live anywhere except under a rock with a $55,000 salary to buy all those tickets, 35, 33 games. Impossible. And in some cases, tickets on both sidelines for 33 games. So there's going to be a money trail of who funded him. And then the other part is going to be the technology trail of who, if anyone, got information from Connor Stallions that is on that Michigan football staff, which means that they could have then taken that information and put it into practice. And what we talked about yesterday, the numbers are staggering. What Michigan has done on the field, and this is why those Big Ten coaches were so angry yesterday, the numbers are staggering. Harbaugh's job was hanging in the balance. He took a pay cut to keep his job at Michigan. They lost to Indiana. They lost to Wisconsin. They lost to Michigan State two times in three years. They lost eight games in the Big Ten over two years. They have not lost a game in the Big Ten since. Not one. They blitzkrieged undefeated through everybody two years ago. Their only loss came in the National College Football Playoff Semis against TCU. And they are undefeated so far this year. Do they have better players because they've had success? Of course they have. Their recruiting has been better. But all of that is potentially nothing more than an offspring of cheating. We'll see where it goes. All right. We have one more super chat um, to read off before we get into the, the Bob Knight stuff. Yep. Shot Town quite a bit ago put in a $2 super chat, said, Reed is my comrade. Workers of the world unite. That's right, Shite Town. Hammer and sickle. Vladimir Ilyich Ulanov. Let's go. You guys are all partaking in this uh, Lila Garrity v. Julie Taylor debate. Yeah. Uh, whose side are you on? Oh, it's not even debatable. <laughs> <laughs> Lila Garrity dated Derek Jeter. I know. People forget. I know. I'm well aware. Friday Night Lights, great show. Yeah. Great show. My wife and I are still watching it, so don't, don't give away anymore. Okay. I know it's been around, been done for 10 or 12 years now. They play football on Fridays. Yes. Love that show. Love that show. Great. You watch that show, Casey? I have not watched You've gotta one You've got to be episode. kidding me. Terrible. Not kidding. I guess i got to put it on the list. Dude, you know, you got to put it at the top of the list. 
the top of the list? It is a great show. Well, someone tried to compare it to One Tree Hill, and yeah, that's well, that's not... that's Slander Boy Reed over here. He calls it a soap opera, and he I says said it's bad. I did not say it was a soap opera. I said it was football glee. Football glee. Football glee. So there's music and whatnot to it. There's <laughs> yeah, dancing it might as out well there on be, the Casey. field. It's a teenage drama. And now Drew has a super chat. Signals had nothing to do with Michigan running it down Ohio State's throat for eight rushing touchdowns over two games. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough, Drew. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, okay. We only have a few minutes left. I, I just want to tell a, you know, a couple of stories that I had about Bobby Knight in my lifetime. I met him in 1974 when he came down to the Red Spring training in Tampa, Florida. And as my dad mentioned earlier, Knight at the time was following the Reds. It was easy to follow the Reds. They were the best team in baseball. 75, 76, 77, he'd come down there. As the years go by, I'm playing basketball, playing it regularly, and start going to the Indiana basketball camp every summer. My roommate every summer at the Indiana basketball camp was Tim Knight, Bobby's son, one of his two sons. He had Tim that ran eventually all the business side of his life and Pat, who followed his dad as an assistant coach at Texas Tech, later became the head coach at Texas Tech when Bobby retired. So started to develop a really close friendship with Tim that maintained as the years went by, go through college, get out of college. I'm announcing the Cubs games in Chicago. Tim brings Pat, his brother, up to Chicago for his 21st birthday. We get out after a game at Wrigley, go hit all the joints right around there in Wrigleyville, and just had a great time. So Tim and I continued to maintain this friendship. Well, as years go by, I'm doing the Cubs games, and every winter, they would have the Big Ten media day for the upcoming basketball season. Now, at this point, I had not talked to Bobby Knight. I talked to Tim, but I had not talked to Bobby Knight in probably four years, something like that. And in 1990, the winter of 90, I'm sitting in my apartment in Chicago, Monday or Tuesday, whatever it was. Phone rings, no cell phone in those days, so it's your you know, landline phone in your apartment. Answer the phone, Tom, Coach Knight. Thought the thing was a joke. But then you realize pretty quickly it's not a joke. And he says, hey, what are you doing uh, about 12, 30, 1 o'clock today? I said, nothing going on. It was dead of winter. Cub season wasn't happening. He says, hey, meet me and Tim for lunch at such and such a time, such and such a place. Great. Did. Sat there the whole time. He never talked about his basketball time, uh, team one time, what kind of year they were going to have, uh, all that kind of thing. Uh, this happened every year for the next six years, where every year I got to go have lunch with Bobby Knight and his son Tim at some joint in downtown Chicago. Okay. I make the decision to leave the Cubs at the end of the 1995 season. They wanted me to give up doing the Fox stuff. I wanted to continue to do the Fox stuff, and I figured I could probably, hopefully, find another job broadcasting Major League Baseball. So I resigned from doing the Cubs games. That's in the first week of October. The third week of November, I get a phone call from the Arizona Diamondbacks. Hey, we'd like to have you come out and talk to our owner, Jerry Colangelo, about broadcasting. Not broadcasting the Diamondbacks. They just said broadcasting. I said, okay. I said, I got an NFL game in Green Bay on Sunday. I can fly through Minneapolis, be there Monday. That's exactly what happens. I land Monday, Tuesday morning, get up. I go meet with Jerry Colangelo. I walk in the door, and I had never met Jerry Colangelo. He owned the Phoenix Suns, Arizona Diamondbacks, youngest general manager in the history of the NBA, Pro Basketball Hall of Fame. Played at Illinois against Bob Knight. They've known each other for, at that point, probably 40 years. I walk in the door. Tom, nice to see you. Watch you on the Cubs games a lot. He said, I just want to tell you ahead of time 
that I think I'm going to like you because of Bobby Knight. I'm thinking to myself, Bobby Knight? And he says, Bob Knight called me and told me that I should hire you as the next broadcaster, the first broadcaster for the Arizona Diamondbacks. I had no idea that that had happened. Bob Knight didn't call me to say, hey, you want me to put in a good word? I know Jerry. No, nothing like that. Bobby Knight did that just out of the goodness of his heart. He knew I'd left the Cubs. He calls his buddy Colangelo. Hey, what are you going to do about announcer? Colangelo's probably thinking, I, we're not playing for two and a half years. He said, well, when the time comes, that's your guy. So, this will wrap it up. One of the greatest things you can have in life is to do something for somebody else that brings them just unbelievable joy. And it's even better when it happens as a surprise. So a year after Bobby Knight leaves Indiana, I'm living in Arizona. And Coach Knight and I had a common friend who was a golf pro named Jeff Sturry. And he says, hey, says uh, Bobby's going to be in town all winter. A friend of his has a house here in Phoenix, and he's going to be around. Let's all go out and play golf one day or go to lunch one day or whatever it might be. I said, that'd be great. I said, please give him my number. Again, no cell phones now, okay? I get a phone call from Coach Knight. Fast forward. Christmas Eve day. I get two buddies of mine and said, hey, let's go out and play golf today. It's Christmas Eve day. I said, let's go out and play golf. Both of these guys were single. I think I was still single. My 30s, 32, whatever it might be, something like that. Oh, he's definitely single. Um, I said, let's go out and play golf. We don't have any kids to worry about. Christmas, all this sort of stuff. Let's go out and play golf. So we jump in the car and out we go to this golf course. We're standing there on the driving range. And one of my buddies who grew up in um, Missouri, huge basketball fan. He's standing there on the driving range and he looks at me and he says, Hey, is that Bobby Knight over there? Turn around, look. Here comes this guy walking out, maybe 40 yards away. I said, man, it kind of looks like him. How about that? He says, dude, that's effing Bobby Knight. I said, yeah, looks like it is. Well, now he gets about 10 feet away, sticks his hand out. Tommy boy, what's going on? I said, coach, meet your partner today. <laughs> Mike Walsh. My, the look on my buddy's face when he realized that he was playing golf for the next four hours with Bobby Knight. When, you, when, when you're able, and, and he was able, not me, when he was able to, to make that happen for some guy and then the way he treated him, I got a text this morning because all of me and this guy, Mike Walsh, and, two of the, and another guy that was with us that day, he reminds me today, we get out on the golf course, Bobby immediately gets my buddy Walsh like he's his long lost friend, best friend he ever had in his life. And they're playing good, we're playing pretty good, me and my partner, another buddy. All of a sudden we get on like the third hole and Bobby Knight pulls out a nine wood. I look at him and I'm like, sure. I'm like, are you shitting me? You're hitting a nine wood? I said, who hits a nine wood that's not 80? And coach wasn't (laughs) close to that yet. He pulls out that club. He sticks it about four feet from the pin. And his line was, as my friend reminds me, he says, the greatest line of all time on a golf course. He said, well... I bet you never even heard of an effing nine wood, and now you'll never forget an effing nine wood. (laughs) He was unbelievable. I love the guy, and I'm I'm not going to claim I was a great friend. I'm not, but but love the guy. I love him. All right, um, what do we got going on manana? Tomorrow we got our picks. Yeah, we got our picks. 
Um, yeah, that's that's really the we'll have another mailbag, but we, it's a big it's a big week of football, Tom. The lot, biggest week yet. A lot of NFL. Why is it the biggest week of football yet? Before well, we get out of N- here today, why? Look at the NFL slate. The the Chiefs play the Dolphins at Seah- nine a.m. The Seahawks play the Ravens at one. At one. The Eagles play the Cowboys at four. And then the Bengals play the Bills on Sunday Night Football. Do you think that's why my son is telling me not to come visit him Sunday? Because of that lineup? <laughs> it's 100% the reason. <laughs> okay. He said, it's a stacked lineup. He said, Dad, I'm, I'm starting to have fun here in Bloomington. Don't, don't, <laughs> you stay home. I'm, I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have a fun weekend by myself. That breaks the heart. That breaks the heart. <laughs> All right, Casey, you'll be watching Thursday Night Football. Yep. Prediction around the room before we go. Prediction. Uh... I have Pittsburgh minus two and a half, and uh, I also like Deontay Johnson's receptions. So those are my picks for the night. That's your parlay? You parlaying that? Mm, I don't know if I'll parlay that. I'll okay. take them individually, though. Okay. Uh, Reed? Yeah, I like, the, I like the Steelers tonight. So that's, that's my uh, – That money my, line or cover? Uh, I'll, I'll say they cover a field goal, two okay. and a half. Zebra? Taking the I tight. know you got a lot going on. Ah, you know I do, and I, I know I do. I'm going to take uh, – well, if we're just giving bets away, uh, DeAndre Hopkins, my guy Colton sent me this one. I love it. Two-plus touchdowns for DeAndre. It's like plus 1,800. Uh, I love the Titans. I love the Titans. The Steelers will not be able to score a point. Titans will be able to score a point under the new leadership of Will Levis. So, Titans taking money line. Let's go win some points. You want to you bet straight up? Yeah. You, you versus me? You want, what do you want to do? I mean, we'll settle it after the show. Uh, an Elliot versus Reed bet. Some goofy, some goofy punishment. Okay. All right, that's yeah. fine. I, I don't know what you want to do. I, I'll, I'll beat you in anything. So it's, that's fine. Sure. <laughs> Tom, wrap up the show. All right, wrap up the show. Uh, nothing coming up after, right? No, no. nothing no. tonight. Nothing going no. on. Box lunch will be back tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow one o'clock. Casey is hosting. That's right. CC. Oh boy, nice. Love it. Yeah. You get you getting your act together for that thing. Yeah. Uh, last last week was. Was not the greatest show. Uh, I did not come prepared, but this week I will be prepared. Okay, be ready, full steam, ready to roll. All right. He hosted we'll... last week without a single topic on mine, so it was great. That would be coming in a little unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we've done that on this show. <laughs> we're, in case if we can help you in any way, you know that. Of Probably course. don't need our help, but if you do, you let it. We're here for you. Got your back. Started the show with got your back. <laughs> conclude the show with got your back. Of course, Tom. Okay. And I always got yours. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Gentlemen, have a good rest of your day. Great show today, Tom. Thank all of you for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you, good Lord willing, manana. Enjoy your sunny Thursday in Hamilton, Ohio. Yeah, baby. Yeah.